and Sam an inspiration. I mean, just really, thank you, Sam. Uh, how many of you find people fascinating? Find people fascinating? How many find yourselves fascinating? Yeah? <laughs> Are you amazed what goes on inside your head at times? Would that be fair? Are you disgusted at what goes on inside your head? I mean, yeah, human beings are complex, messy creatures. And then we have this thing called leadership. And uh, somehow leaders are supposed to take these messy, complex creatures and inspire them to be able to achieve greatness. Now, I don't know how many books on leadership are there. If you go to Google and you type in the word leadership, how many million websites are there? Uh, if you go to Amazon and type in the word leadership, how many thousands of books have been written on leadership? And yet we still have a leadership problem in our world. Would you agree? You know, if you think about the leaders that have inspired you in your life, those people that have truly been f uh, fundamentally critical in the way that you have developed yourself, I wonder how many of them there are. Can you count them on one hand, I wonder? Well, if, if you think about leadership just from an abstract point of view, it's actually fairly easy. This is all you have to do. You have to articulate a compelling vision, something that's not going to inspire me only intellectually, but also emotionally and viscerally. It's something that's going to connect with my values, grab me by my values, compel me to leave behind what I've done in the past and to move towards the future. And if you can outline the plan and then give me the resources and hold my hand along the way and by dint of your example lead us into this wonderful light and show us the way, I will follow. All right? Easy. Now, what's, what's the missing piece here? Well, clearly, there's not only the understanding of how do you create wonderful leaders, there's also the people that have to follow. And I wonder what the story of followership is all about. What causes someone to follow? And understanding the, the nature of followership, I think, is the key, the, the key element here. And if good leaders could understand followership, then you'd know how to articulate the message, what rotates their crops, what inspires them to get in, involved, and what can encourage them to get to the places that you are seeking to, to create. I, I was fortunate enough to get this in my early life. Uh, is my accent still obvious? Can you hear it, my accent? Yeah. Uh, whenever, whenever I start speaking, it's always, always fascinating with the audiences. Uh, invariably, not here, but in corporate audiences, I get this sort of behavior. Okay, here's this black. Here we go. Uh, oh, God, he's a South African. Yeah. They're all arrogant dickheads. You know that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, make me laugh, monkey man. All right, so I don't know why I, I, I get a bit of that. But uh, growing up in South Africa was a, f a, fascinating, uh, a fascinating experience uh, because by the time I got to university, I was one of these um, student activist types. Anyone been in a riot? Anyone done rioting? All right, no, a few of you? All right, if you, if, you haven't done, if you haven't done rioting, I'll give you a few tips on how to do riots. First of all, you need the three R's. All right, the first R, righteousness. All right, you need to be right. Next, rage. All right, you need to be seriously pissed off. Third, Rocks, right? You've got to have something to... And, it, and it's also good to have a crowd, because if you riot by yourself, no one pays any attention. Now, what, what we used to do, of course, is that we get ourselves into a lather of adrenalized rage and hit the streets of Johannesburg. And over here are the police. And what do the police have? Well, they've got the shields, the gas, the tear, the tear gas, the rubber bullets, and the dogs. Now, you, we run towards them, and we're now clutching our little weapons. We throw them, and you quickly run out of rocks. So you do the fourth R, which is run. Now, now, rubber bullets are extraordinary. If you've seen them in, 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 on TV footage, they're about this long and they get fired with compressed air and they spin. And if you get hit by one, boy, it's, the pain is almost unendurable. I was, uh, unfortunately, I was only ever hit once, but sadly, on my back. So I must have been running away at the time. So, now, but now let's just step back for a second. Now, I, I don't want to trivialize this because to get someone or to encourage somebody to put their body on the line in front of extremely dangerous, life-threatening conditions because you have a vision that is greater than yourself is what followership is. So who and, or what were the conditions that gave us that sense of almost a responsibility to push ourselves into those domains? And of course it was the leaders. And the leaders who understood that if they could connect with something that was deeper than ourselves, that was greater than ourselves, that connected with our values, it inspired us to move forward. Now, if we're going to, therefore, understand the nature of followership, what do we need to understand? Well, firstly, we are hardwired to be followers. In fact, I would say that human beings are herd creatures. Would you agree with me? We follow fads, we follow trends, we have a, we have a, t a tendency to look at what's the rest of the herd doing and we'll follow that line, follow that line. You think about this. What's the formula that most of us follow in our lives? Here's the formula that gets given to us in our Western culture. And it's something along these lines. 
You're born, if you're lucky, into a two-parent family. For the first five, six years of your life, you learn a language or two, you learn motor skills, like how to walk around, how to dress, use toilets, etc. But you have no discrimination. You are just an open book, and every single input that comes in becomes the bedrock on which you're going to build a life. Your value system, your belief system, your cultural influences and religious and so on. In those first six years, the Jesuits say this. Give me the child to the age of seven, and I'll give you the human being. So these are the first seven years. Then you go into the schooling system, or six, seven years. Schooling system. Now you have knowledge acquisition, learn to read and write, new ways of behaving, because you've got now you know, classmates to deal with, and another layer of authority, because you've got now teacher to student. You learn cooperation, teamwork, and then the hormones kick in. Remember that? Ooh, now you're going, who the hell is going on? And at this point now, you're starting to assert individuality. You're now creating a sexual identity. You're getting a sense of your place in the world. And then someone comes and asks you this question. So, what are you going to do with your life? Right? At this stage, you hormonal soup. You have no concept of what you want to do, so you make something up. The idea, of course, is to finish school and then move on into creating your own life, to leave the family unit. You go to the university, you might go gap year, but find a, find a job or get, create economic independence. So finally, you do that, right? Now you've got to look around and go to find somebody. That's part of the formula. All right, so you scan around, and there you find them, your soulmate. They just happen to be three desks away from you. Who would have thought it? I mean, of all the seven billion people in, your, in the world, you were there, and you say things like, isn't it amazing? If we hadn't worked in the same building, we would never have met. That's true. All right, so, so you, you meet this person. All right, so now you commit for life. Dun, 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 dun. So you now the three M's kick in. Marriage, mortgage, maternity. Now you've got kids to worry about. You're, married, you're paying your mortgage. At this point, you're saying, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? And you've got to worry about the superannuation and having a career and all this sort of stuff is going on. Evidently, you have to have an affair or two. Someone told me. So all of this is going on. And then finally, your kids leave home. And they only leave home at 30 now, don't they? All right, so finally they leave. Bye. Who are you? You've been raising kids for the last 35 years. Oh, okay, great. All right, now it's time to retire. There's a banner with your name on it. There's people standing around holding cups of cheap champagne, wishing you well. All right, here's my email. Keep in touch. You buy a caravan, drag it around Australia for five years, and then you die. <laughs> That's the formula. That's what we get offered, right? That's the offering. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. However, most people will follow the formula with just complete compliance. They don't question. They don't test. They don't, they, the, the challenge here is, if this is just the formula and we follow it, then we are being ovine, sheep-like in our thinking. Also, the formula doesn't work. I mean, what's the divorce rate in our society now? Well, it's around 45, 50%, right? 45, 50%. How many would have elective surgery with those odds? Right, who would, would, you go, would you go skydiving? I suggest not. But no, I'll commit to you for the rest of my life. Uh, by the way, the marriage vows were written at the time when life expectancy was around about 40. <laughs> so, until death do us part, long time. All right, so, all right, so also, also the whole issue around employment has, has changed. I mean, how many young people right now with degrees are at home finding difficulty in getting a job? And they're sitting there at home watching day, day, daytime television, then they watch their parents come home from work looking mega stressed. Oh, my manager's such a bastard. By the way, get a job. Why? <laughs> you look thrilled to be alive, right? right. right. So, so, so this, this is the formula. So what do we need to do is to start thinking about, well, what is it about followership that we need to tune into? Now, not only that, as followers, is there some onus of responsibility around how you behave? You know, in workplaces, there's so much emphasis put on how leaders are supposed to behave and the value systems that they've got to live by and the, the qualities they're supposed to exude and the skills they're supposed to create. But what about the people that need to follow them? Is there some onus of accountability, responsibility from the followership point of view? And I would suggest, su suggest that there is. Now, there's a couple of things to work on. I mean, from a follower point of view, I think one of the most prevalent um, problems in workplaces is the prevalence of the mask game. Now, I'm sure you've come across this yourselves. What's the mask game look like? Well, this is when someone, or well, all of us in fact, we will tend to put on um, uh, masks for different occasions. And so we have what's called the public face. Now, we, we, we've all experienced this. Who's been to a boring presentation? Anyone been to a boring presentation? Yeah? Who's given one? <laughs> okay, so now, now in, a, in a presentation which is not necessarily hugely exciting or engaging, we've learned to put the mask of attention, the public face. So it looks like you're paying attention. You even have the two-minute nod. Hmm, fascinating. <laughs> right. 
Meantime, you're writing emails, planning calls, thinking about what you're going to do for lunch, right? So you have to... Uh, who's been to a meeting that's a waste of time? Anyone been to some of those, right? You're sitting in... Uh, I, I love meetings, right? Look, I think at the end of the day, going forward, it's about stepping up to the plate and thinking outside of the square. You know, we don't want to go after the low-hanging fruit here, you know? So I think if we can get the buy-in of all the steak... Oh, shut up. All right, so, so you, you sit in these meetings and the people make decisions and you might be sitting there going, this is just ridiculous, this is dumb. But you, what we, we comply. We go, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we should approach this strategically. Use that word a lot, right? So, so w- what we have, though, is this other side of the coin, which is this other mask. And for, from a follower's point of view, let's unpack what this looks like for a second. Uh, and this is what we call the pub face. All right. <laughs> So people have this public face, which they show to the world, and then they have the, pu- the, pu- the, the pub face. So, for example, you're in a meeting, you think it's just absolutely ridiculous what they're doing, but you comply. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. On the way out, you grab a colleague, you go into an office somewhere, and you go, can you believe that? What a lot of crap that was. And that's where that bitch, right? Passive aggressive. Do you guys do conference calls? I love the conference calls. Hit the mute button. Can you believe these people? You were saying, right? Passive-aggressive, passive-aggressive, right? And when this starts to become prevalent in organizations, it becomes toxic because we don't believe what people are saying. You know, I, I learned this the hard way. Anyone from Adelaide? Who's from Adelaide here? Anyone? A few, a few of you? Uh, I worked for a radio station called SAFM, Real Music in Real Stereo, right? It was one of those cool FM stations. I was the marketing dude, right? I, I used to drive around in a car called Black Thunder, right? So, and I'm, I'm 24, man, and I'm thinking I'm too cool for school, man. It's all very cool. Uh, but now, as the 24-year-old marketing guy, I'm having conflict with Alex, the sales guy, right? Now, the reason we're having the conflict is that Alex is putting on really bad uh, commercials because he's keeping his production uh, uh, costs low to make margin, understandably. But he was compromising the sound of the radio station. So I had to go, Alex, man, you've got to push up the standards here because you're affecting the whole brand. Anyway, we fought. You know when you're about 24, 25 years old and you've got that sort of... You got that behaviour, like who's the biggest ape in the room? It's a bit, so we are quite childish, to put it mildly. I go and see Paul Thompson. He's the managing director. Paul, I can't work with Alex, man. The guy's a dickhead. I'm sorry. He's got quiche for brains, man. How do I work with him? Paul goes. So hold on, Colin. Hold on. Yeah, Alex, could you pop in for a second? Right. In comes Alex. Oh, thanks, Alex. Colin's come to talk to me. Clearly, there's a conflict. We need to resolve it. Colin. Please repeat to me exactly what you said. <laughs> I go public face, don't I? Ah, oh, yes, Alex, I uh, came to talk to Paul about how we could work more strategically together to be more aligned because there's no I in team. And, uh, so Paul said, no, Colin, you didn't say any of those things. Please repeat exactly what you said. Have you ever blushed from your toes, man? I, I'm standing there going... <laughs> now, internally, I get a little bit furious. Like, you know, but, you know well, how dare you put me in this position? I create my own justification story. He would not let me off the hook. I had to say it. It was hugely embarrassing, you know? I said you were a dickhead. I mean, really, it's a... So I noticed Alex nodding because I discovered later that he had been through something similar. He asked Alex to leave and he sat me down. He said, Colin, in this organization, you never talk about your colleagues with language you were not used to their faces. How dare you? We are not children here. This is not the politics of the playground. Don't play mask game with me. Don't play the mask game with me. If you want to work here, this is the standard. And what he was telling me is that this is the standard of followership in this organization. That's how you play. And I think what leaders need to start to articulating is what are the standards you want to live and play by? And the followers, by dint of the fact that they are employees, need to live and operate by those standards. And if you create that st- the, those standards, then you start to develop something that is going to be worthwhile in its creation. Because how many people are living with reluctant compliance? Do you know people like this? Do you work, do you work with people that go, well, it's only 15 years to my retirement. I think I can stick it out. Right? This is tragic. Anyone work with negative people? Negative people? I mean, negative people really, uh, it's a choice. I mean, where do we live? We live on one of the greatest places on the planet. And yet, how many people still whinge? Do you notice that the boats aren't leaving Australia? Do you notice that? They're not leaving Australia. Right? And people bitch and moan about it, right? No, 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 no. If you, if you live here, there's a, a, a requirement of followership here to step above negativity. You know, sometimes I walk into corporate land and I see people sitting there and they look like flesh-colored stockings full of pus. And I go, come on, man, you know? Wake up here. This is a standard that we need to operate by. 
I also think, too, you know, there's this whole notion of, of this parent-child dynamic that we need to overcome. Too many leaders take on a parental role in trying to care for the children or the staff. And this dynamic here will reinforce some of the adolescent childish negative behavior that we were seeing. It's like the yes but chickens. You know the yes but chickens? You're in a meeting and every time you suggest something, the yes but chicken goes, yes but yes but yes but yes. Right? And I just, <laughs> come on man, as a follower you need to be a contributor. All right? Anyone can be a retardant. Anyone can be an inhibitor. Right? So we need, to, we need to elevate the game here. Uh, if there's one aspect or one attitude, I think, that we start to elevate both in the follower and the leader is this, is to operate from this uh, uh, attitude in life. And I'm going to contradict myself in a moment, but let's just talk about it from this position first. And that is to never, <coughs> ever take it personally. Too many people will take everything personally. You know people like this? They suffer from terminal uniqueness. Right? They always think, that I'm so special. And they're everywhere, everything's a sign in their world. I wonder what the universe is trying to tell me. Nothing. Right? You are, <laughs> the universe isn't, in fact, focusing on you. I know it's a shock. Right? There's seven billion people on this planet. Sometimes it's not about you. And, I, and, and the obscurity of signs. Uh, oh, a bird crapped on my shoulder. I wonder what that means. <laughs> Nothing, right? There's billions of birds and billions of people and the shit shoulder conjunction will happen, right? It's not a sign, right? It's not personal, right? People say everything bloody personal. This is, comes from nature. Have you, have you seen those David Attenborough docos? Aren't they fabulous? Right, you see the uh, antelope grazing. You see the lion crawling through the herd. Charges into the herd. The, the antelope leap and, 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 and run away as quickly as possible. Now a lion only catches something about 10% of the time. They miss a lot, right? So the lion gets exhausted. <sighs> right? And the antelope can be 40, 50 meters away. They see the lion is exhausted. They go straight back to grazing. They don't stand there going, I need counseling. Right? It's not personal. <laughs> It's not personal, right? And this notion of this, this, this uh, there's uh, been a whole movement about, uh, you know, embrace the inner child. I'm wondering with followership, should we be embracing the inner adult, right? What is it that we need to do to grow up? And the leader has the responsibility to work as a, as a colleague, not as the parent. In creating true followership, it's a collegiate experience that we share together. The other thing I think we need to discount with leaders or start to no notice with leaders is that we need to change our expectations of them. People have such an artificial view on what leaders are supposed to do, hence the continual disappointment. You know, and as a follower, realize that this is a human being just trying to do their best. Look, I'm 54 years old now, you know, so it took me to my mid-30s to work this out. Now, if you don't know this, this is gold. No one anywhere really knows what the hell is going on. We're all just making this up. Would you agree? Would you agree? Have you ever been delegated work and you go, yep, leave it with me, get to your desk? <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Help. All right. well, we all just make this up. You know? I, I sit on a few boards, man. We get all this data, all this content, and we pretend that we know what we're doing. We're making these decisions. Oh, you strategically, Clive, yes, indeed. <laughs> we don't know. Nobody does, right? We're just all making it up. You know, and once we realize that, you know, then we have the humility to be able to recognize that we are, we are adults in this game trying to create something together rather than I am the guru on the hill, I am the victor and the champion, and you must follow me to this great future. We need to change the conversation. And I think of what it is, it's about looking at leadership, but it's also looking about followership. We can get these two together. I wonder what we can create in our organizations and in our people. Thank you.